Hi, everyone. Um, welcome for a very, very special episode of um, Chat Over a Dram. I actually haven't done one of these for three or four months, and I thought a really good way to uh, kick things off will be to bring a rock star, you know, that's a term you could use for Alan. Hello, Alan. How are you? Hi, Ash. Good to meet up. It's, it's been a year since my trip to New Zealand, so great to speak to you. Yeah, it, it feels weird. I mean, we had this amazing time when you were here for Dramfest. And yeah. um, we had you in Auckland for um, our 8 p.m. whiskey tasting as well. And um, one would think by now I'll be there visiting you in Scotland, but um, we, we meet on a video call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always welcome to come to Scotland when you can get in, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alan, um, just to put a bit of perspective, what time is it there in Scotland um, right now? It's seven in the morning. Yeah, yeah so seven. I, I, I really appreciate it. I just wanted everyone who's going to be watching to know that, you know, you've made this time available and, um, you know, especially on uh, a Sunday morning, uh, 7 a.m., yeah. so, Yeah. I'm heading out to hell walking, looking for the sites of some of the illicit distillery bothies on Ben Rennes this morning with my friends. Yeah. Oh, wow. nice, nice. Well, that's making us jealous. New <laughs> Zealand <laughs> uh, a beautiful country too. And yeah, I see yeah. now you've got a, an official New Zealand whiskey classification and 19 whiskey distilleries. Yeah, uh, the, the boys and girls have been working very hard to unify and solidify, you know, what yeah. needs to happen. And it's a shame it's taken so long, but it's good they have and they have, I guess, a, a document or some rules in place. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Alan, um, should we maybe start by talking how long you've been, you've been in the whiskey industry? I've been coaching all week. It's 45 years. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you're spot on. I joined the industry in 1975, straight straight from school, just for a, a summer job showing visitors around because by, in 1975, uh, whiskey tourism was very much in its infancy. So uh, I got a job and I, just, I thought it would do me to see me over till I chose my career path, but... The whiskey industry chose me, and I, I haven't thoroughly enjoyed it since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, 1975—that's that, that was nine years before I was born. So um, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you're making me feel old now. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I think, like whiskey, your your long experience is very appreciated. And um, how long have you been with the Glenlivet specifically? Well, I, I first joined the Glenlivet Distillers, as it was then, in 1979. Uh, I left for a short time and then was reunited with uh, the Glenlivet. I actually started with the Glenlivet Distillers in the Cooperage for the Glenlivet Distillers, which was at Glen Grant Distillery. Uh, yeah. Another legend of the industry there, Dennis Malcolm. So, Dennis, who's he's... Uh, celebrating 60 years this year so it, it's that sort of industry we know everybody we, we know we know a lot of folk but it's it's a big industry but it's, i think you ash uh, noticed when you were in scotland it was quite a intimate industry a wee bit how i felt in new zealand it was an intimate place you know it was that sort of thing and, and the, the similarities to new zealand and scotland i found quite uh, fascinating but the mountains are so much bigger in New Zealand. But yes, I've been in the industry a long time, so I've been very lucky. Master distiller for the past 12 years for the Eagle of Yeah. yeah. You know, it's very, um, I can not say how you find similarities, but um, when I came back from Scotland, I did a drive out to the East Coast, to Napier, and driving through the centre of New Zealand, I, I was finding a lot of similarity, you know, just the, the ruggedness, and I, I kind of thought, Somehow I've not noticed it before, but it's a lot more noticeable now. Yes, and uh, I was, when we were at, down at uh, Dramfest, one of the startup distillers has his own farm. And one of them said to me, his grandfather said that farming in New Zealand was the only difference from Scotland was the scale, the vastness. You know, yeah. you know, Scotland were all 
we're all clamouring on to this little bit. In fact, Scotland's the least populated part of the United Kingdom, but he said it was just the scale. And I says, oh, that's it. And I can understand why many uh, Scots went to New Zealand when, when I heard these sort of stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, 12 years as uh, the Glenlivet Master Distiller, and um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Jack, you know, our New Zealand brand ambassador for Glenlivet, who's actually put this all together. You know, um, he's worked in the background and um, he informed me, I think I had new, but uh, we're going to talk about the Founders Reserve and the Captain's Reserve, which have been released under your guidance. Yeah. Um, so should we talk about the Founders Reserve first? Absolutely. We'll start, we'll start with the Founders Reserve. Yeah. Mm. That's it. In the park here. Um, the Founders Reserve was, oh, it's, a, it's a few years back, but single malt sales have increased greatly. And what we found was we were running short of some stock. Because whiskey is a long-term game. You need a massive crystal ball to predict. A year ago, we just had heard about the virus, but look what's happened a year on. So it's always very difficult to predict. But the team were asked to look at Glenlivet and say, look, we need to be careful with the stocks of the older. You know, we're maintaining good uh, growth in 12, 15, 18. And this whiskey is as all made, like 18 and 12 years ago. So we were asked to look at the founders. So it was uh, one of those fascinating things that we were uh, allowed to create something slightly different from the Glenlivet 12, but always retaining that lovely fruity floral of the Glenlivet. That we decided to make it a little bit creamier. So we increased the amount of fast fill uh, bourbon wood in it. And that, that allows the creamy notes. But the nose, that delicate Glenlivet style, you'll get the citrus fruit in it. Uh, I always like to see a bit of toffee in Glenlivet. You, when we make it in the new make, it has this uh, slight toffee, banana, fresh, fresh fruits from the orchard. And it comes through... Uh, v v very nice. So it gave us the flexibility to take the whiskey without the age st statement saying we need that whiskey all to be a certain age. It allowed it to go back and forth and create a, a style. It's been very successful in its own right, which is which is a, a great work, great news for the team. But it's also quite versatile. It mixes well. Yeah. Because I think, um, unfortunately, New Zealand was one of the countries where the 12 was taken out temporarily. Yeah. And uh, it created a bit of, um, uh, uh, let, let's just call it, an, an inc inconvenience for a short period of time. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. That's a good point, Ash, because even in the United Kingdom, the 12-year-old was withdrawn. And the 12-year-old, and we're speaking about... 45 years ago, that was considered a very long-aged whiskey at that time, 12 years. McCallan was 10, Glenn Fiddich was 8. Eh. But here was Glenlivet, this 12-year-old, this classic of the style. And I used to always say to folk, always go back and revisit at Glenlivet. You'll have heard me say that. Always go back and look at it. And you've that fantastic story about yours. Glenlivet, Ash. But mm. I say to folk, go back. Mm. If you're in a whiskey journey, feel free to go around all the different flavours because I like to look at all different flavours. But I always come back to Glenlivet because the complexity, uh, the balance of it, it's got all the flavours in the right place. Mm. Yeah. But you'll I'm find in the finish. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? You forget in the finish that lovely, creamy and smooth. Mm. Any whiskey, that, any whiskey, that, sorry. <laughs> any whiskey that's left will be going on to my porridge later when I have my breakfast. <laughs> oh, now we now we know how uh, you do forty five years um, <laughs> in the industry. Yeah. So, so that's that's the founder. So. Lovely whiskey, lovely balance, yeah. No age, but you 
to always taste a whiskey without looking at a label. Always look at the whiskey. That's why we do some of that uh, mystery ranges. It's to allow you to use your own senses to look at the whiskey. But lovely, well balanced. Yeah, yeah. Have you, um, the Founders Reserve, do you remember now how long has been out for? I, I think I've seen for at least five years or longer. Yeah, it's five, it's a good five years because it was taken out, I, I can, well, I can remember the stock issue. What the company wanted to do was maintain mage marks in certain markets, as you've just spoken about, but also make sure that the 15, the 18, the 21, 25 were all growing. So they wanted to preserve for that, but we had expanded the distillery in 2008, and we knew that was, there were stocks that were a little bit laid down for the future. We subsequently expanded the distillery again, but this is we expanded the distillery in 2018, and that was really to look at from 2030 onwards. Yeah, mm. to have stocks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, it's it's a blessing in disguise. You know, you can go anywhere in the world, any decent bar with a limit on the back shelf. You know, it's a it's a feat in itself to consistently have a starting point. You know, which yeah. you know, it's a it's a, it's it's a challenge. You know, to keep it consistent for the consumer to be able to just order it consistently. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll always hear distillers speak about the teamwork, but the teamwork for that starts from the agricultural community through to it being malted consistently to the distillers, to the the teams in the warehouse and the, 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 the blenders teams who select the certain whiskies to ensure that consistency of style. So, yes, that's that's a great work. But that's really following on and it probably is a nice link back to the Founders Reserve because that's where, why George Smith's Glenlivet whiskey from its illegal roots became such a famous whiskey was for that fruity yeah. floral Bayside style, but a consistency of style that the consumers knew even uh, over 200 years ago. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine uh, just commented, Phil, that uh, 12 still remains one of his favourites and sort of an all-time whiskey. Yeah, I, I, we always like to hear that, Ash. And, and anyway, so I'm drunk, I live it for uh, a number of years. I always go back and have a look at it and you'll find what we're speaking about, uh, about the complexity, etc. But approachable, it's that classic of the space age style yeah during your travels here in new zealand were you able to get down to cadrona i missed i missed cadrona by one day jack uh, jack jack looked after me uh, in new zealand and we went to see the thompson brothers uh, thompson's distillery yeah. uh, i met the cadrona team uh, where they, they owned up it they looked at the glenlivet design when they were building Cadrona, and I was really impressed with the whiskies. Uh, there was another, uh, I forget the family couple, lovely whiskey. Uh, even, you know, uh, you know whiskey's good at an early age because it's it should always go into the cask of high quality, and that's what I know. But the, the thing I took back to the team was a sample of, of the, what's the name of your wood? Is a Manuka? The Manuka. Oh. Manuka's wood finish yeah. Yeah, that yeah. they they are all using. I thought that that was really nice and uh, complemented their fr uh, fruits and sort of styles of whiskey very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. um, a friend of ours, Kenneth, um, he's uh, high up there in the Cadrona setup. He's just said um, he loves the dram. Yeah, and um, yeah. what is the production capacity at Glenlivet? Do you even know, or do you do you just keep filling casks continuously? Check, check later, just keep making lots and lots of good whiskey. It, is, uh, it, it has the potential to make 21 million litres of alcohol now. That's quite, it, it's probably it's the largest in space I just now, but uh, Glenfiddich has went through a, an expansion and McCallum went through an expansion. That's quite large in malt distillery terms. Uh, uh, he made one cask a week in 1824. We're now making many casks. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. So, 
still in the same, same area. You know, still using all the ingredients that the founder used. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what did they say during the tour? Uh, water, barley, and yeast. Those are the three you need. Nothing is going to happen without those three. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's the same for any distiller in the world. It's quite it's quite simple ingredients. And you, well, the ingredient smalted barley is the cereal that grows this far north. Because remember, we're fifty three degrees north. I think we are uh, same latitude as parts of Russia and Alaska. But the Gulf Stream keeps Scotland, believe it or not, warm. But uh, not not the warmth that you'll see in uh, in your uh, summers in Auckland, but it keeps our climate warm, and we grow this lovely malted barley. But I I, I know now that New Ze- last year New Zealand is one of the most efficient uh, yielders of barley, so the record sits in New Zealand now, and it's yeah. also a little trick that we use when we are developing the malted the distillery to get an extra season. If we're growing up a barley, it takes about 14 years to make a variety. We send the seed to New Zealand for its holidays, and it grows twice in the same year, and then comes back, grows in Scotland, and grows back. That's a, that was an old uh, trick we used for speeding up the, the development of barley. Yeah. Nice. That's very nice. Yeah. So nice. talk about the second one that's been released under your leadership, the Captain's Reserve. Yeah. So this is this has been in the go about four or five years. Ash, uh, this was uh, the captain reserve, and why the captain? Because he was a great grandson of George Smith, the founder we spoke about. A hundred years ago, in uh, nineteen seventeen, he was fighting in the First World War with one of the uh, a Scottish regiments. Uh, Smith Grant was his name, and about a hundred. Well, he inherited the distillery about a hundred years ago. Um, what can we do? What can we explore? What uh, what can we do to make it slightly different? And we've noticed that probably the next whiskey we we've done worked very well with us that we used uh, French oak. So we spoke, looked at using French oak, and it's funny. I was listening. Listening to an old whiskey cast, some of the early ones, and the guy said, Yeah, we tried because they didn't work. But our team had looked at it. We have connections with the cognac industry through the company. So we selected some casks that had previously held cognac. So we took the cognac casks and we wanted to play up a little bit the, the toffiness, the spiciness of the whiskey. But we took a different oak that we used for the uh, the 15. We took trunk key oak, and that's sort of cognac it comes from. But it was to overlay something and manage. There's a great relationship with the Scots and the French. It goes back to the Ald Alliance when Scotland was united with the French against the English, as we tend to do. You know, we always support. So there's a big relationship with France, and that's why uh, we got we're early casks because we're wines, we're cup, uh, brandies, or exactly we're all landed into the ports in Scotland. So the casks were cheap. So the, this was rediscovered. So we select some of the Glenlivet. It's been matured in American oak or European oak, and we select some of it to be matured in this cognac cask. It's held the cognac. So. So it gives a lovely, lovely uh, fruity style, but it interlines that fruity floral of the whiskey with that raisiny, uh, spicy notes of the uh, cognac and also the tronquia oak, which is a hard oak, which uh, it's like in between European oak and uh, the American oak. It's a finer grained oak, and it was something uh, that we liked. The captain actually inherited the distillery the first world war and the launch of this and it's been very successful we do have an aged one for the united states but this one's non-aged mm. very um i recently finished my open bottle i had to open a new one now um 
had opened a new one for the purpose of this video because um this late night with a uh, bit of Netflix it goes mm -hmm. down too easily. Yeah. You see how the 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 poached fruits, the poached pears there, but then you've got that lovely raisiny note. So I think this is a perfect compliment. And, uh, the May cognac is very similar to making whiskey in the sense of they're, they use pot stills, they use the grapes from certain regions, uh, it's very limited in control, etc. But when you speak to them, they have the same passion and they're the same uh, words for describing the flavours, except they're French. <laughs> but it's that same passion for making a high quality uh, spirit, which is very similar to us as well. And I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic blend of the, the two. Yeah. yeah, that was fun. It was looking at the history of the whiskey, uh, the maturation styles, and just playing with the glue of it, maybe adding something, stretching it a little bit. And we've done subsequent things like the Caribbean cask finish, where the team have uh, sourced uh, high ester rum to do do things like that. Mm. Because the east coast of the United Kingdom, Liverpool and Glasgow, where were grew in fame because they were closest to America for shipping rums and sugar uh, back over. Lot, lots of controversy in that about that trade in the country just now, that that's part of our historic uh, change. But we've this historic change, the uh, trades that we did with Europe, etc. Because up until Second World War, everything that was shifted around the world was in casks. And the reason oil is measured in barrels, this is that's how they, they measured the the oil because they put it in a barrel. Uh, ships, tonnage, tons, that's a, a, a wine and spirit trade name as well. Well, so it, it, this interlink. But a lovely whiskey, and again, it was a lot of uh, fun. You see the toffee apple note coming through in it, yeah. you knows it and sort of tastes it. That's what I like about it because I love it. That, that bit of toffee playing with it. You'll see it in a, a few space out whiskies, but I love it very subtly done. It can go to like a Bonoffi style at times as well. Yeah. yeah. Alan, uh, the video is going live on uh, LinkedIn as well, my, my personal LinkedIn. And a, a good friend of ours, Peter Ryan, he's the Irish ambassador to New Zealand. He's watching the video and uh, he's just commented that. All right. <laughs> Uh, he doesn't like whiskey. I just like to say that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he doesn't like whiskey spelled the right way. <laughs> uh, but uh, he commented that uh, Ireland and France um, have a similar relationship, except on the rugby pitch. Yes, that's right. Uh, Scotland, every Scotsman supports Scotland or the team that's playing in England. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's like us with the cricket. With the rugby yesterday. Yeah, yes. We, we, funny enough, Ash, this, uh, the northeast of Scotland, where the distilleries of Speyside are based, due to the rain shadow of our mountains and our climate being prevailing from the southwest, we have uh, we actually have quite a dry summer. And there's a great tradition of playing uh, cricket in the coastal sea area around Scotland. Uh, so cricket's not unknown in uh, Scotland. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Uh, I saw England get thumped. Okay. Yeah. So there was just a little start at the end of the video. That's yeah. good. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm end of the line up here in space. Out. <laughs> so the line is <laughs> I was going to say, um, I was actually in Scotland exactly three years ago this week. Um, this day, I would have been at Brooklady, but um, I had come in straight after some big blizzard had come from Siberia or something. And uh, when I came to Scotland, I brought every piece of sweater and jacket I had ever owned. And even then, I was so cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we're used to that. that you know, if, if, when I first went down under to Australia and New Zealand, and then when I went to New Zealand, you were saying, oh, it's the start of autumn and that. And I'm, we were sitting outside one night and I'm saying, this is autumn. This is 
this is so comfortable. It was so <laughs> well, the first day Jack I arrived, Jack took me up to Wahiki Island to sort of take me into uh, the time zone. And, of course, I got sunburned. It was such a beautiful day. Yeah. But it wasn't considered hot, but I, I was going about with a red face. So, yeah. It shows you how far north we are. We're nearly Eskimos in Scotland. <laughs> I um, The day I went to Glenlivet, I um, wanted to take a picture of me using my tripod in front of the distillery. And I, I'll send you the picture. You will laugh. They're not for public sharing because they're very bad. But um, I took my gloves off to get the camera going. <laughs> I was nearly pleased to death. Like, no, 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 no. This is way too cold. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. well, well, it's been ve- it has been very cold. It's now it's our spring. Where is it today? It's a bit. It's a bit. I'll just look at the temperature. I think it's about six or seven degrees just now. So that's quite nice. So, yeah. So it's nice for me. Yeah. But we had a lot of snow this winter. Yeah. We um when I came to Space Art, I stay at the Kadu house for two nights. And um Oh yes, up at the Kando. Yeah. And uh, beside Johnny Walker. Yeah, I I didn't go to the distillery, <laughs> but um I, I wanted to stay at Kadu house and I stayed in the Glenlivet room. I don't know if you're familiar with the different rooms with different names. Oh right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. The, yeah. uh, Cardew is interesting because from Cardew Distillery, you can look straight up to Glenlivet, mm. which is about 10 miles away. In the early days of illicit distilling, if the cutter crew were coming, the excise cutter crew was coming from the coast, uh, the Cumming family used to put in their stacks a flag, and that warned their neighbours that were in the glens. Because they're they're right on the Spey Valley, but you can see up to Glenlivet. And if, if you go in the hill behind uh, Glenlivet, you can see down to Cardew. Both both eighteen twenty four distilleries, so they're, they're long heritage. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone's asked, um, oh, Glen Mowen, um, if you remember, Glen and I hosted you together in Auckland. He's yes, that's right. Yes, yes. We uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll park his question because I want to talk about the Glen Level 15 next. Um, Fifteen? Yeah. So I think I was telling you earlier, um, Alan, um, because obviously my family, we've been in the liquor trade for 16 years, and um, it's been a long journey to now, which is the good part, I think, because I'm exposed to some really high-quality single malts. But... Um, I can still remember the time when dad brought that home for the first time. And um, when I was drinking it, it, it made me to think about the flavors for the first time because everything prior was smooth and easy. And the first time I actually found spice on my palate and I had to stop and think about it. Yes, well, the my, my predecessors, when they developed the, this style of the 15-year-old a few years back, again, it was an extension of the age from the 12, the he, the, they, they thought, and he, well, they told me that they were looking to make the love it slightly different. It's a little bit like the founder's story. We, we, we know the 12-year-olds, that classic fruity floral stuff. We wanted to play the creamy toffiness. And you've just said to, to the 15, we wanted to play up the spice note. So what he, he did again was, and remember I said to you the stories, we were always told, oh, watch out with cognac or brandy casks. It can make a certain style. Uh, it's not. It, he went he spoke to the guys in the cognac, and this is we for the first year. New cognac is putting a new cask, but he thought, "I what I'll do, I'll do that at the end of the glen of its maturation." And what you said, you love that spice note. That was what they were trying to do, and it's it's an old distiller's trick. If you want to make increase the spicy notes in your casks, use a European oak cask because. Traditionally, the certain oaks are all different, but the European oak's softer and it gives more compound into spirit. So you get lots of that lovely, spicy, that gentle 
a cinnamon note on it, and it's very popular. And often I, I find a lot of uh, uh, Glalivet fans are great 15-year-old fans uh, for that uh, uh, sort of spiciness note. You see the, when you nose it, you get that sort of, to me, it's a sort of grapefruit aroma, that citrus. Hmm. It's nice and smooth. Of course, the oaks have had 15 years to react with that glalivet, glalivet fruity floral, but I just love that spiciness, that cinnamon note. And it takes mm. me to uh, rich fruit cakes. It takes me to that sort of place. See, when I um, when I find spice or that harsher character in a whiskey, um, I always feel at the back of the palate, and when the flavor lingers, the spice sort of stays at the back of the palate, and I find the citrus and the sweetness in the front. Am I saying it right? Or yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, because your your tongue does four parts. It tastes that the fruity, sour uh, sort of note. Your nose is incredibly accurate because remember when many folk visit a distillery or a blender's uh, room, uh, they're amazed at how many samples that we look at. But it's all by nose. You do the the the, the blenders. Etc. will do the taste, new tasting notes. And also the other trick is the only thing that you can't know is you'll see folks speak about salt, but you can't know salt. Always, if you, so it seems a shame to put salt in, but it's a trick we used to do. Put salt in your whiskey. What do you smell there? Yeah, taste it. But you will taste the salt. So mm -hmm. that's it. it. It was an old trick. It was an old trick. It was done because because the blenders did because in Lake of Isla, the whiskey used to be floated out to the, the ships to take it back into glass, or things like that. Mm. But lovely spicy and also glalimit, very well balanced. So the spices, they complement that citrus fruitiness of the glalimit, as you can see. Yeah. Mm. And also, also, the, the, the team at that time had to be congratulated because they made something slightly different with this classic Glenlivet style, but they made it slightly different. A, f a fantastic Yeah. 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 Um, a friend of ours, and I think you might have met them at, um, at uh, Dramfest, um, the old distillery. Robert Old has asked the question, if you can please ask Alan, which release through his career has been the most fun putting together? Uh, well, that's a, it's an interesting question, Alex, because I, I'm a distiller, so I make the I make the whis I made the whiskey. I've made all made the, a lot of these whiskies that were tasted. Um, there's there's a team that puts a lot of the whiskey together. I, uh, it's the chief blender and his teams will. We'll, we'll play with the flavors to ensure of that consistency of style. And so I've been involved in things throughout the years. But the one that uh, uh, which was fantastic, the 50-year-old, the Winchester uh, collection, they called it. We have done three bottlings and that. And that was a surprise because the marketing team never told me they were going to put my name in it. So that was a big surprise because... Uh, my name is not the most Scottish, so my forebearers have been in Scotland four or five hundred years, came with King James the, the Second of Scotland. So we've been here a long time, but with a very, very English name. So he used to say to me, oh, we can't use your name, Alan, and say, but you can't use it. So something along the line changed and they put my name in it. So I'm just I'm proud of that. I'm Proud to represent the whiskey, but I'm, I'm looking up here because I've got my bottles of the Alpha, the Code, the Cipher, and we're just we're releasing the tasting notes of uh, uh, Spectra this week, and these are mystery whiskies. And I was part of the team, you know, that we've presented that these would distill. But that's been fun. And as I said, it's all it's a really fun because we do a lot of quiz. We do the digital experience with it where you can pick your wits against myself and the team's uh, sort of tasting notes. And that's been great fun. fun. Uh, so that's been fun uh, being part of uh, over the years. But I think uh, it's just so satisfying to see Glenlivet uh, 
in its rightful place as this uh, real holder of heritage and space. So I'm, I'm proud of it. out of a of it in a sense. Mm. Well, I think... Um, I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think I'd be quite happy to have my name on a bottle of whiskey as well. Not not just because I paid them to do it, but out of respect. Um, and I think it's highly <laughs> of... Uh, uh, the work you have done. Yes, yes, yes. It, it is strange seeing it because the other thing is, Ashford folk would ask me to sign a bottle in New Zealand. They say that's your signature on the box, and I says, "Why are you surprised? Because <laughs> that's how I write." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, signing the bottle—that's a real American thing. You know, you see a lot of the uh, Jack collectors. Yes. yes. Yes, uh, Ash, and also it's another thing is somebody was asking about the master distiller title. The master distiller is really, really in the past in Scotland, that's an American term that came to Scotland. Because all of it is so big in America, the, my predecessor was always introduced as the master distiller, so the, the, that stuck. Uh, but we were just or in charge of production. Uh, uh, what was it? My, you know, my production title was distilling manager for Chivas Brothers. So, yeah, that, it's, it is an American thing. But it's funny how it gets copied round. I do it now. I often, if I meet, meet a fellow distiller, uh, Don Livermore more this week, week uh, is 25 years with Hiram Walker. When he came over to Speyside, we did the swap with the rye casks and the the, the space egg casks went to uh, uh, Canada. They came over, so I got him to so uh, of uh, his his fantastic Canadian whiskey as well. He's a very passionate guy who who has really taken Canadian whiskey to a place that really justly occup, uh, occupies in the world of whiskies. That's very really, very nice. <laughs> Uh, one question for you, Alan. Um, obviously, I didn't visit the warehouses at the Glenavid, but I went to some smaller warehouses and other distilleries, and I noticed some tequila casks. Maybe I don't know if I was supposed to see them or not. Is that something you see coming in the future? Or uh, yeah, I think I think he must have been at about a Jewish warehouse about the tequila. <laughs> Uh, always never rule anything out. And if you do see something at a distillery, it just shows you that there's maybe something in the pipeline. Uh, there's a finishing going on somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, you would get, I would get, sh I would get shot by any marketing team. They would say, Alan, do not release that. We're not in a pl place to release that. Always remember, there's what, there's tireless experiments going on all the time. Look at certain flavor types. We, we are constricted, and it was one of the fascinating things that New Zealand is a, has not stipulated oak because that allows you to play with the manuka wood as well. But we are oak, but you can see within the oak family, we've already we've already tasted uh, whiskies from poor poor type of oak today: uh, 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 Tronquilla, Limousin, uh, European oak from uh, Spain, and also the American oak. All mm. Got great uh, potential. The men great for the distillery character in, but I've said to you, if you want to add spice, you add the European oak. So yeah. Mm. Well, I think is uh, I um I, I like that sort of uh, finish, you know, because obviously you guys have this amazing relationship with State, and we're going to talk about one of the uh, cask age whiskies. Uh, you have an abundance of uh, one-time use ex-American oak. But it's the second finish. I think that's really cool, and that's where your experimentation kicks in to give us that enhanced flavour. Yes, the, team, yeah, the team's done that. And, and let's, hey, to be honest, Ash, they've done it. That's been done for hundreds of years because sometimes a whiskey would come out and they say, well, it's maybe not got the balance we like or it's not got a flavour. And the old idea was you just put it in a first fill sherry cask and you would overlay some flavors, you would add some more complexity, uh, you would modify the flavor to take it to where you wanted. And that's been done over the years, but there's been massive experimentations over the years, port, 
uh, all the different casks. Your tequila, yes, yeah, tequila. I know there's tequila casks within the industry. Tequila again, a fascinating spirit. We always, so I, I go away on a, a tangent as usual, Ash. But Long Morn, when we make make Long Morn spirit, some of the team identified the greeny note in it like a tequila. So mm-hmm. we're always fascinating other spirits. So this is just the continuation of this, that to, to use the casks. And also to take to the, the consumer, you, the, the whiskey lovers, to take to you something that's maybe slightly different or something we knew about. And I'll take you back to this the mystery malts that we've done at the Alpha, that was an experiment that I remember in my early days was done when we took new American oak straight into the Scotch whisky industry, that the casks were emptied. And this was first after Scotch that were new to Scotland. And we, the flavours were slightly different. But they were looking for something different. The team says, oh, there's some of this whisky that was laid down a few years ago. And that's where we took it out of the inventory. But yeah, that, you're right. Uh, you know, like going to visit a distillery, it's like a spying mission. Uh, if you get round a competitor's distillery, because they might be up to something, you'll see something. What's that there? What's different there? So it's it's great fun, and it, it adds to it increases the knowledge of the subject, and uh, it's it's great to see that. I love it style of being stretched or added to and taken to a different place. Hmm. I actually had a question for you. Um, I don't know if you can answer it, but um, I had a small task at home that a local distillery had done for me. And after so many weeks of long wait, I found it had completely leaked and it's empty. Um, and I know for fact you guys have just thousands and thousands of barrels. Does that happen ever? Do you, are you checking every barrel every so often to make sure or? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, you're right. The big, the big companies will have millions of casks mature. Soon. There's like I think it's about twenty million plus casks maturing throughout Scotland. Uh, wow. Just look at the SWE thing. Wow. Okay, twenty million. Uh, if we stop produ- if we stopped, uh, if the industry stopped producing, it would be years and years before we ran out of whiskey but then there would be nothing for the future. That's how it works. Um, so the casks are, yeah, the casks are chained, are checked. Uh, we try and make sure they're watertight before they uh, are filled. But there can be accidents happen, which is one of the one of the bad things that can happen. That they can leak, yes. They can spring a leak or it's not been noticed. Etc. So the angel shares increased in that sort of occasion. But like a, a very small distillery would have a very tight uh, cask policy, keeping an eye on it because it's worth so much in a smaller scale. But a large company has as well. They they will have uh, teams that look after the casks as well. Hmm. Very interesting. Because if something down, you lose it in a few years' time. That's that. That's. That's bad news, you know. That cask that you've specially selected for the 50-year-old that leaked in the last week, so that would be... <laughs> that, that would not be... be crying. <laughs> crying. <laughs> yeah. Actually, when I went to uh, Glen Turret, um, they have this glass cabinet thing, and they pointed to this cask, which belonged to some banker, and um, the guy who gave him the tour, he said uh, he hasn't come back for a while. <laughs> and I said, well, at what point do you just take the cask and well, drink it because he could be gone. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the big companies do not sell the casks like they used to because you would you know you could buy the whiskey. You can't still buy casks of new make from some of the companies. Uh, some of the bigger companies keep away from it from the brand more to control itself. And you you said it earlier, Ash, was consistency that the company controls the consistency of style. The whiskey comp- the malt whiskey companies, grain whiskey companies, distilleries used to swap casks with each other. Right. And we still right. do that. We still do that in the sense to give a say, since then, when we have company distilleries, 
But that's because we swap with each other to ensure, and that was for consistency of style within the blending industry. It was also considered uh, a loss control sort of mechanism. But single malt it has to be the product of that distillery. The laws are very tight in that. Glenlivet, though there's many of the distilleries used to have the Glenlivet title, they weren't Glenlivet. They were Abelauer Glenlivet. They were Macallan Glenlivet. Uh, only two distilleries in Speyside have never used that uh, Glenlivet suffix because that Speyside whiskey style was used to be considered Glenlivet. But mm. as the name's been protected mm. by law, etc. But yeah, that that that's the, that's the how it works. Yeah. Should we talk about this beauty? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to make it up here because I haven't got one of that lovely whiskies. Well, um, I just talked the viewers through it. Um, so this is part of um, the single cast range. Well, this is the second one ever that's come to New Zealand. The one prior when um, Dave used to be around, that was the 14 year old. And in the middle of last year, this turned up actually with a lot of lack of fanfare because I think it came around June, July and everyone was just so distracted because of COVID. And we still have a lot of bottles, which I have no problem with. I'm more than happy to drink everything. <laughs> <laughs> But I just, um, I feel this is such a privilege because there are many markets who do not get single cast releases from the Glen Levitt and to have an exclusive cast available. Um, so this is a 18 year old American Hogshead. What, what, is that a refill Hogshead? Uh, it doesn't say, it just says American Hogshead 56.8% and aged 18 years. Yeah. and. Alan, can I just make a good point? I think everyone should buy this bottle because it was bottled in the February of 2020, probably the last month we didn't have this shit show going on. <laughs> now, that, that, is, that, is, that is the ultimate small batch of from Glenlivet uh, ash. It's a hogshead, so that tells you it's 55 gallons or 250 liters. If it's a hogshead, in American, it's been rebuilt out of American staves with two new ends put into it. You can see by the color, it hasn't imparted a great deal of color. Yeah, so really? a natural color. You see the strength of it? What strength is it? 56, 8? 56.8. Yeah. Rule of thumb, the whiskey loses half a percent per year of maturation. It's 18 years. So it's lost 9%. Rule of thumb, it's nearly correct. So that tells you it's maybe matured in a Scottish climate, and that's the strength of it. Now, the filling strength can be higher than 63.5, but 63.5 is uh, was always considered the ideal filling strength. Now, if you're keeping that whiskey 50 years, it'll come nearly to 40%. And that's why you sometimes see them bottle it just before 50 because the strength of the alcohol in the cask is reduced. That, that's a reflection of where it matures in Scotland. It's usually less strength is lost in the East Coast. You keep it in the island of Isla. That's why you don't see a lot of old Islas unless they've been kept in the mainland. Mm. Uh, single cask, as I said, is just an expression of Glalivet from one cask. Now, then we often describe them, they'll be limited. I think there's only 300 odd bottles in that bottle. 306. So that's that cask style, 306. So that's it, 306 bottles, that's the end of it. Well, there'll be another cask. It might be similar, but there'll always be sort of nuances that's nice. That American cask is the opposite of what we've been speaking about, European oak, add spice. The spice is not there. Now, I had to look at my tasting notes, uh, Ash, about that one. But what I remember of this style of cask, et cetera, is a very rich, fruity beer note on it. It's uh, that, that balance of beer. So that's a distillery character having 18 years of American oak 
reacting with the, the spirit to give more of the distillery character. So if it was a first fill sherry, the cask influence would be higher, but in the American oak, it's lower, but it allows more of that intense, sweety fruit to be concentrated in Glenlivet. And that's often a favourite of mine. And yeah, I think it's great. So instead of you buying the cask and you, you bought, here's the whiskey from the cask. We've looked after it. We've nurtured it. We've bottled it. And that's the single cask. So that's the ultimate small batch from, from, from the distillery. So, but that's that is a lovely. It's a great age, yeah. Oh, I see you have a bottle of illicit distiller there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um I I I have collected some of the Australian releases as well because um a friend of mine's asked twice now, so I'll 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 read his question now. He wanted to know what the next New Zealand single cask might be, and may I request it be a sherry cask because um. I have, I have to drink the Australian ones. We would like to drink a Kiwi sherry cask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> now, that, that's the thing. Jack, Jack and the team in New Zealand will be twisting the folk in Scotland. We are wanting this type of cask next year. Uh, the team will look at that and say, well, yeah, we've got casks, you a cask, etc., or some other market. So, yeah, it, hey, it's great fun. It's it's more work for the team that puts it in the bottle because it's a batch, it's 306 bottles, that's it. But that to me is ultimately back to the original style of the whiskey. You bought your cask, that was the bottles out of it, that was the style. But true to the glow of it with that fruity floral uh, uh, style of it, you know, that citrus fruit, the fruity floral, head to toffee, but very well, but Glalivet, it's balanced, but when it's also non-chill filtered, that's that's something we don't chill it to take out the thing, put it in the fridge, stick it out or, or the deep freeze and it'll go cloudy, but there's nothing wrong with that, that's the fatty acids and things like that. Some of the team say it doesn't affect the whiskey, I think sometimes you feel that lovely creaminess which is a style of egg, no chill filter. That's why the Nada, the Nada range was taken out. It was to take the whiskey more as it is as it comes out. Come out some folk like that, and it's it's a, it's some, but it allows everybody to have what they want. Yeah, yeah. So that's New Zealand. I'll have to come back to New Zealand to get a bottle of it. Yeah, well, I'll keep you a bottle. Of yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you anything you like, Alan, um, if that allows me to visit a, a warehouse of Glenlivet one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, hopefully, hopefully we are, we'll be back to uh, normal quite soon. But uh, there, I know speaking to some of the local dis uh, distillers, Vista Setters, they're hoping to get back to normal. Our summer, which is your winter, mm. uh, Half of us have all half the population's been vaccinated now, um, but they're still it's still there. It's still in the community, so mm. I think there's still a bit of work. But hopefully, we can get some normal. It's very quiet actually in Speyside because last mm. summer was amazing. Here's the weather, beautiful weather, but no visitor. Alan, um, I just wanted to take you back to March last year. You know, there was about two thousand of us drinking whiskey heavily in Christchurch at Dramfest. And um, I, everyone I know who went to Dramfest did not get COVID. I think we built some good immunity by drinking a lot of The only one, uh, the, the, it, was, it was the first warning because I, 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 was, I was in Christchurch and you know how we all come, well, I've only been once, but we all, we all assembled, all us, the, still hours assembled. Cheerio, we'll see you sometime. See you, see you soon. And I, I went to Australia after that, and then things were going fine. And then somebody, oh, it was George Grant was in the, the lift. He was in my hotel. I came out the lift. He says, did you hear about Dave Broom? We'd done a presentation with Dave Broom. Dave's in quarantine. Oh, my goodness. But none of us were contacted, which was good. 
So Dane had to stay in New Zealand. I always remember when he came back, his writings said, I should have stayed in New Zealand. It was much more, <laughs> it was much more organised because we were late in the wave. Yeah. But by the time I got back to, I was called back, well, I had to go back a few days early because the Melbourne uh, Grand Prix was oh. cancelled. So I, oh. I flew back, but of course, I'm looking at the folk in the plane. I, I know some of these folk. Where did I know them from? It was all the Grand Prix folk heading back to, uh, yeah. uh, we were all heading, where were we heading? Dubai. Uh, and he, he was, that's, that's, a, that's Damon Hill. That's, <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was quite a surreal thing. And I remember going out Melbourne. I'd never seen an airport so empty. So it was surreal, uh, Ash, but... The only thing I would say, that was a funny part of the trip, but it was a great trip and it was great being in New Zealand and uh, uh, speaking to you. And Dramfest, as you said, it was a superbly run uh, festival, uh, you know, and we very everybody very polite, etc. And as you, you said, uh, New Zealand seemed to have a, a a lot of respect for alcohol in a sense so that was good to see as well mm. yeah hey um are you aware of uh, our native timber called kauri k-a-u-r-i kora kori yeah. oh I, hey, hey. yeah someone wonders, you are I. someone wonders if uh, that could be used to make barrels because it's a it's a quite a thick um obviously um you will go to so, jail for using it you're not allowed yeah. to cut it anymore. Is it like a teak? Very um, hard wood. Teak. It is very hard. Yeah. Because the you know the 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 column the column distillation, the coffee still and the grain yeah. distilleries. When coffee invented it, he used iron and it uh, reacted with the whiskey. And after that, and I think there's still one coffee still with Cara wood and the Caribbean making rum. If you go into the internet and put wooden stills, you'll see it. And they took the New Zealand Cara wood because it didn't react with alcohol. Right. It was it was wood, but it was a very, very hard wood. But I've, and I've, I've seen reference to it in the United Kingdom in fermentation and distillation. Mm. On maturation, I haven't heard about it. Yeah. And as you say, we'll probably get into trouble for not taking it from a sustainable source. <laughs> no, well, yeah. yeah. The other thing was, um, it, it might have been uh, Dave or someone else uh, back in the day from Pernal showed me a stave they had brought in. And in a way, you want the barrel stave to drink some of the whiskey and go back and forth so the flavors are released. Absolutely. Uh, in America, the penetration, the, the American distillers call it, call it, they char. And the reason they char it, their wood is so strong. It's a tight, fine grain. The European oak is, it, I have to watch what I say, it is heated and it's heated over a fire to make it, to make the wood supple. As it, they heat it, in an American oak, the red liquor layer, the alcohol goes in and takes the colour out for the bourbon whiskey. Now, we buy the casks because we will still get some of that colour out. Also, the reaction with the sugars, the heat, means that we get some of that flavours out into the whiskey. So if you're looking for that creaminess, that uh, toffee notes to be accentuated, you're looking for that part of the wooden structure into your whiskey. Hmm. So it's what it gives the important to it. Cask, a cask's an amazing thing. It, and I of, often say to folk, think of it as a reactor. It's this oak reaction. It, it's osmosis. It breathes through it. It takes off ca characters. But the alcohols react with it and extract sugars as well. And also because it's change in strength. You see the cask strength is down at 56 eight. It's good through, it extracts at different alcohol strengths, so it's very thing. We then with ways of trying to speed up maturation, but the slow method of maturation hasn't been recreated, and that's why there's millions of casks mature.
two or one. And they um didn't they do something in a laboratory? Um, I don't know. I remember the article. I didn't want to read it because the, hor- the title horrified me. I'm like, go away. <laughs> this is one technology I don't want to see. I want an 18 year old. I don't want it aged in a minute. Yeah, well, that's right because uh, uh, the the agent the agents are, are long, long thing. It ties up a lot of whiskey. The accountants would love it, an accountant would like it out at a certain date. I want it at that date. But uh, it depends on the production you have. So there's lots of the crystal ball. But yes, you can recoup. The goal of it uh, and products will be subject to quite stringent uh, tests by our own uh, chemists. And a lot of that is to ensure that if I Heaven forbid somebody uh, does something fraudulent to it in one of the markets. We can check that. We can analyze it. We can say, right, that wasn't, that didn't come from us. It didn't come from our casks or something like that. So it's it's one of those things. But science has science has helped us to understand it. But the most, the still the most uh, simple tool is this one. Because mm. I was always told. You can change anything you like at the distillery, but you can't change the flavour. That's the style for that distillery. That's what we want kept, and that's what you try and do. Now, that's been the fun of of when you're asked to make something different, where you can play with it a little, but the Glenlivet style is very it has to be a very consistent style. So, mm. yeah, you know yourself. Oh, okay. I can't help it. Tell that glass of wine oh, before you even have to drink it. Sorry, there was a little stutter just there. Um, you know what's interesting is I have come to this realization that this video is working absolutely fine on YouTube, LinkedIn. It's actually my home internet that's not good enough that it keeps cutting <laughs> out because I keep checking it on my smartphone and everything's running smoothly. It's running a good pace. But when I'm trying uh, to do right. it, there's like, every now and then there's like a little stutter. Yeah. Well, that, that could be my uh, Scottish internet up here. Uh, we've been trying to sort it out, but uh, of course, normally we might be in the dist- the distillery with a super fast uh, uh, connection. We have uh, the high quality line, but it is the last bit of copper into the house. I think it is the problem. So, that's <laughs> but, so saying that, uh, Ash, if you'd said to me a year ago, you'll be doing a lot of zooms and things like that, and I'd be saying, "What's that?" You know, <laughs> it's, it is, it's allowed us to speak to each other, which is quite, uh, which is great fun actually. And we've been yeah. doing a few of these, speaking to certain folk. And as as you came to me, I said, "Oh yeah, 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 so, yeah." Well, can you just imagine the sanity of this planet if there was no yes. video calling? <laughs> well, that's right, yeah, because uh, it, it, it's amazing. And we, my my two daughters are in two different parts of Scotland, and it's the only can speak to them just now, and yet one of them's not far away, but it's in a different area, so we can't go up there just now. So, mm. But we've always got the whiskey to fall back on. Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, you made that point earlier about um, how much stock is available. Um, the, some of the ships have been slower to get to New Zealand because they used to come Singapore and here, but now they kind of do like a zigzag around the world. But stock is still coming and people panic. Uh, this lady came into the shop asking, is is there a gin shortage? I was like, I think gin will never be in shortage. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, the the... the there was panic that uh, uh, we well I can't I can't go and get get whiskey I can't go to the visitor center because you, it's closed but luckily uh, my local uh, my local uh, store up the road being in the village of Dafton has a lot of good single malt and has got a lot of good blended whiskies as well so luckily I've, I haven't run out nice <laughs> I've also my I've also my collection to go go and drink uh, yeah yeah the husband there has been one or two special bottles has been open just to, yeah. yeah yeah that's all good i think um we might just end it here alan because i know you you just come up to atm um i just wanted to thank everyone publicly um, i'll have a quick chat with you just off off the video 
But hey, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, yeah. Leave some more comments if uh, you have any questions. Um, Alan is on Instagram as well. Um, so you can uh, just follow him and his journey there. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all looking forward to having you here again. Um, hopefully for Dramfest even next year. Uh, I think the team from Whiskey Galore will be so excited if um, they could have you back. But um, Oh, yeah. Well, you see, Michael, Michael Fraser Milnes, he has, he, he, him and I went to the same school. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I have to come back and drink a whiskey. He's got yeah. a special level of it I took over to him, so I have to come back and drink it with him, he says. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you, that, you, that, that's how whiskey works in amazing ways, doesn't it? That's right. Well, thanks for everybody joining yeah. us. Uh, Slanjavar. Slanjavar.